place that usually is not visited by many schools. And in particular, when I went to, to, uh, to Virginia to do my field work, I, I tried to go with the school that I worked at uh, to, to spaces, and the principal said yes to the museum and not to the park, because what are they going to learn here? Right? What is it that you can learn from a space where there is no guide, where you just walk around? And, and I think one of the interesting things about this space is that it allows for, for us to think of pedagogy, learning, and studying in different spaces. One, one aspect that I did not include in the, in the book, because I, I got to read this book after I finished mine, is there's a, there's a philosopher of education called Tyson Lewis who, who wrote a book distinguishing between learning and studying. And he said, learning is the reigning paradigm in education not right now, and it's set up by the objectives one, one sets in advance. It, learning, you, you can be done with learning by assessing that learning and figuring out whether you have learned or not. You can uh, establish in advance the end point, and you can say you're done. Um, study, on the other hand, is a dwelling. It's a way in which you get submerged in a particular topic without necessarily knowing why you're getting there, and definitely not knowing when it's going to end, because there are no indicators, no measurable indicators of when study is over. So in a way, what I'm trying to say here is that a few things is that, first of all, the park offers a possibility of study that pushes against the limits of schooling. Because in schooling, more and more, it becomes harder to find spaces of study. Which is not to say that that's the only thing schools so should do. I, I have to be very clear here. I think the museum, I think the textbooks and all that have a very important role in schooling. But the museum, in some ways, does something that schools already can do. They don't necessarily do it well, and the museum does it differently. But this idea of presenting a place in which the lessons to be learned are predetermined and are clear. The, the park, on the other hand, it presents a notion of democracy that is different, that is based on trust and on the possibility of things going wrong, on the possibility of circulating that space and not knowing in advance what kids or adults are going to learn from it, of maybe people going to a space and learning nothing. And I think that possibility um, is necessary to think about how to incorporate that possibility into schooling, into thinking of the curriculum in different ways. Because otherwise, we're foreclosing by trying to plan something that's unplannable. If we try to plan democracy in advance, the risk is that we're foreclosing possibilities of disruption. We're just foreclosing possibilities of a different understanding of democracy, which is closer to what Rancier is posing. Democracy not as a system of government is predetermined in advance, but democracy as the act of disruption of that particular way of sensing the world. Um, and, and while I, I, will have, I was having this conversation in class with Tom yesterday, I try to be careful not to put art always as a salvation, as the space that always is different, that always will save us from the limits of other things. Um, I'm, I'm, I think you can do this in spaces that are based on math or based on other other fields as well. But I think what this space of the park allows us is to think about it differently. Not necessarily in the park, but using the park to think about what the limits are of the ways in which we are trying to protect democracy by planning and planning the subjects that are going to be the responsible citizens that inhabit that democracy. So, thank you. Mm. Yes? The Malvinas War, if I well remember, did have the support of the people. Yes. And uh, then, was it also then in the end something that broke down the well, the, the, the ter terrible failure of that war. I mean, what it showed was, first of all, uh, it, it made very evident the control of the military over the media. Because while the media was claiming that Argentina was winning, people were being slaughtered. It was, uh, a, in many, many people read the Malvinas War itself as a last resource of the military to, to recapture the popular imaginary by creating a nationalistic sentiment against the British, but it, it was such a, I mean, it was such a slaughter of the Argentine, for a ridiculous war in some ways, that um, 
the, the failure of the war, uh, if the war had been won, which would have been ridiculous, but if the war had been won, maybe we'll, the church would have subsisted a few more years. But it's like, if, uh, I don't know. No, in the long aftermath of years, um, it's, uh, do you see a chance that Argentina may eventually get back to Armenians? I don't know. Within the global perspective, with global justice? I don't know. It's really not my topic, and I have particular feelings that are not very welcomed within Argentina. I, I do think that it's 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 very paradoxical to speak about the self determination of the people when we're talking about places like Bolivia and Ecuador and all that, but not necessarily asking the people that live in Malvinas what they want. It it's a very complicated topic, and maybe we can have a conversation after the stand, but it's a little bit outside the, this, and it's more about my amateur opinions on that. And I'm sure that here many of you are much more experts on that war than I am. You have lots of time afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Finny. Uh, well, yesterday was the anniversary of yes. the Dia de la Memoria, the anniversary of the, the beginning of the dictatorship. Uh, but the, in, what's interesting to me in the Parque de la Memoria is the fact that uh, the the part that attracts most of the visitors is the one you didn't show, which is with photographs of the disappeared. And it's not a permanent, I mean, it's the exhibit that uh, is organized by uh, ICOS uh, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the human rights group. But it's something that citizens learn from early on that as, as representing the, the, the reaction to the dictatorship. Mm -hmm. While the arts, uh, which is where I come from, unfortunately, <laughs> is not something that people know how to read, as you said. Some of these abstract sculptures could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. So how do you negotiate those two uh, uh, points through the studying and learning paradigm? So I, I think First of all, it's very interesting, so how certain images, right? What the right kind of learning for dictatorship is, right? The right kind of learning is looking at silhouettes. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's, there are certain icons of dictatorship. It became yeah. icons, and so now those reflect dictatorship, even though those, of course, in another context would reflect something else, right? Um, but that's why I think it's so interesting to think of the potential of the park, the parts of, so like you said, the art in the park is always empty. There's no one there, right? Because people yeah. don't know what to do with it. And so what I would say is that in terms of schooling, in terms of curriculum, the first part, the icons and the, 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 the clear lessons are necessary. That's an important part. But I think, in my experience at least, most schools are already trying to do that, sometimes more or less effectively. Right? But it's interesting to think of why is it that schools are afraid of not knowing what to do with art? Why is it that schools are afraid <coughs> of having a place in which students may not learn anything? Right? And, and just for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with the Argentine education system, it's not a system that is so pressed on like standardized testing like the US where there's no time, where it's like, it's not such a regulated system as here. So it's not a matter of people don't have time to do that. I mean, I love teachers, teachers never have time. We never have time to, to do anything, but you could have the time <laughs> if you wanted to. But there is a, there's a hatred of democracy. There's a fear of what the possibility is of trusting students to make their own meanings out of the space. Even when I don't think that, me, that that should never mean abandoning the other part. But I think that a specific part and many other possible experiences that I think are encounters in the, in the Deleuzean term, like means encountering things outside the image of thought, encountering something where there's no rules that tell you what to make of it. That presents a potential for a different kind of curriculum that I think we need to start embracing. But the question is whether that would be a curriculum, because in a way a curriculum is a planning. So that's what the tension is. The curriculum is the planning of those experiences. So if this experience that, by definition, cannot be planned, then how do we make sense of them? Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's interesting also that the, the movie that became iconic of the dictatorship and won Oscars is about the teacher. It's about the, the educational system. Right. Yeah. Do we can build history and learn things 
as ourselves, not how we relate to the states, how we relate to the West, and the previously our system has always been, what sort of trickles down comes from up there? How does that fit? Can you say more about the question? Because I'm not sure I, I fully understand it. So, but often when you, when you talk about Argentinian history and government, it's always very closely tied with, with the United States. No, I, I didn't say that. Well, not, but, but what's, what's happening? Oh, you, you mean me, you mean in general. In general. Oh, in okay, general. sorry, sorry. How, how the dictatorships were connected and oh, influenced, okay, okay. and how the history defines itself as what sort of came from, from up So I, I think you can answer that in several layers. Well, first of all, the notion we are now ourselves, we are now our own nation, is an indictment notion. It's not a notion of Argentina. I, I'm sorry to like burst the bubble of nationalism and saying Argentines are not unique. Like in that sense, notions of curriculum, notions of, of pedagogy, and all that are all part of a much wider system of thought. That even when it's done in the name of individualism, like individual ideas of democracy that are uniquely Argentine. They're never uniquely Argentine, right? And it's not because they're imposed. I'm not talking about imposition. I'm talking about a particular way of thinking about people, about society, and all that. I have to do with a Western idea of how society works, right? So that's why in, in, in the book, I hope the way it's read is, is kind of two-layered. On the one side, I'm talking Argentina, but on the other side, I'm talking about how we use the past to define who we are in general, within a particular enlightenment project of being agents in the present to shape a new future and all that. So even the, the project of autonomy is not autonomous. All right? So there are specificities to Argentina that has to do with its own relation to the past. But the way in which the past is conceived as a progressive narrative, right? That's, that's not Argentine, that's not American, that's not European, that is modern. Yeah. I was interested in what you were, talk <coughs> what you were saying about how, how long it's taken, how it took Argentina 20 years to get a handle on, t on this event that was so obviously a horrible event. Yeah. And, and, the and how's that happened in so many places? I mean, it took Pinochet 30 years to get to trial. So, you know, it's happened in so many places in the world. We have to de declassify information. We have, we have to go through this whole process, and finally we can talk about it. Finally we can do this almost to the point where, it's, where all those people are dead, all those generals are already dead, and it's mm -hmm. almost become irrelevant. And I'm, so I was wondering if that was, if that's just happens everywhere, if, that's, if we need those 20 years to, or, or in the case of Argentina, and this is my, sorry this is such a long question, but <coughs> I don't know if you're familiar with like, so I'm thinking of the, of the documental Memorias of Saqueo, mm -hmm. which is basically talks about how the, the dictatorship was horrible, but what happened during the Mena years was even worse, because it, 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 um, the neoliberal, the, the process, uh, process of privatizations and everything made a permanent, uh, had a permanent, negative effect on Argentina, which was started during the dictatorship. But mm -hmm. So, that th and those processes are more complicated to understand. So like, the threats to democracy now are more complicated. Like, is it that we can't understand what's happening now, or is it we can't understand what's happening now because it's more complicated? You know what I'm saying? So, let me have a preface to answering your question. The preface leads to where I just answered to her, which is, well, your question points to, and, and my presentation itself points to, how difficult it is to step outside the system of thought we're in, or maybe how impossible it is. So, like this idea of a progressive narrative of the nation, you just repeated it. Like, so do we need 20 years in order to progress to a point where we are ready to, right? That's a progressive narrative of the nation. But it's very hard to speak without notions of progress and without notions of development. So I'm not saying the question is wrong. I'm just saying we are all embedded in this process. It's not a what my research does is, is makes it very hard to talk about resistance as, as something outside, but we are within it. So it makes it very hard to do to, to that. Within that, I have to say that 
the Argentine case proves in, proves in some way that it's not necessarily progress because right after the there were trials, people were imprisoned, and, and there was a moment in which the dictatorship came to the fore, but then in the Menem years, it went back to the, to the back, right? In some areas, because this was not a homogeneous process. It happened in different places in different ways, right? So I, I don't know if, if I wouldn't be comfortable probably putting a normalizing process on, okay, do all societies in the world need 20 years to process this? Like, I don't think that kind of statement, because what that does is in, impose a particular framework on the events of the world as if they were all the same, and, and I don't think they are. Um, there was a second part of your question, but I don't remember. Yeah, like, I mean, do you think Argentines, do you think that as different societies, we'll be talking specifically about Argentine society or American society, has, has difficulty recognizing what are the threats to those demo to democracy today? Like, it's easy to look back and say, 20, with, a, with a historical perspective and say, well, yes, this, 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 this horrible di dictatorship was obviously a threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. but it's harder to recognize, that, or more controversial to recognize, to point a finger today and say, well, today the threat to democracy is this. That's, that's my dad's answer, right? It's like, it was normal for me. So that's, that's the, the starting question of this. Like, what is the water we are swimming in, right? What is it that we are not able to see because it's what we consider normal, that we need to try to put an effort into stepping back and seeing how is this? So another way of putting it is, is like, when I was here in Madison, I, there was a program, still that exists, I think, where international students are invited to high schools to speak about their countries when teachers are talking about it. So one teacher invited me to talk about the Argentine dictatorship. So I went to high school, and then one of the things I asked them is, so do you think like, uh, something like clandestine con con concentration camp could ever happen in the US? And they said, no, of course not. We are different. And so I said, what about Guantanamo? What about the internment camps? So, and, and, but it's very hard for, for someone to see, so for a fish to see the water it, it's swimming in, right? But and I, and I don't think it's impossible. That's the work we need to do. That's the work of the intellectual. That's the work of the scholar to, to make certain things visible that maybe are part of the common sense. Yeah. I'm interested in, in the relationship between the Argentine dictatorship and the Yeah, I, I think you're completely right. I think the, the memorial and the, the specific memorial, which is the wall, it's called memorial, it, it is a, a different kind of space than the rest. But what's also interesting is, is this one here, which yeah, this, well, this used to be actually many of these. So they're part of a group called Grupo Arte Callejero, a group of street art. We used to put these signs in the middle of the city, kind of disrupting the flow of the city by alterating traditional traffic signs and the fonts and all that to signal certain things. So in the middle of the city, there would be a sign saying, X concentration camp, five kilometers in that direction, right? Or here is a genocide, or do not turn to the left. It was like, the, do not turn to the left as a, as a symbol of the, the fight against the, But when this is kind of shifted to, to this park where it's out of context and it's that as part of an exhibit, something changes, right? And so it's even, so there are many layers to this that I, I can, by the way, if anyone is interested in the book, email me. Because the book is really expensive and I'm sending in the PDF. <laughs> and, and there I go a little bit more into that. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, she had a question and then, yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, you know, since you've been talking about how the past has been very significant in constructing the relationship between the Argentine and the Right. 
Honestly, I haven't. I mean, in this particular study, what I did was look at mostly how the dictatorship appears in curriculum and in memorial spaces. So I, I really, that's not my area of expertise. I wish I knew more. Maybe in the future, <laughs> if I plan it. Yeah. yeah, I have a statement and a question. The statement is I, I, I actually have contributed a um, high school textbook um, and a, a history textbook. And um, that experience opened my eyes to the fact that there is a large variety of contexts in, in which you can actually produce mm -hmm. this artifact. Uh, and you know, I, I read about what happens in Texas with school boards and how controlled some of the content right. of the textbooks are, is there. Um, and, and, and because of that, and I happen to have had an experience with really opened my eyes in the sense that I was not controlled at all. I was never told what to do or say. My, much of what I say in that textbook is really um, based on historiography. Um, and so my question to you is, how much care did you put into examining the kind of the context or the processes of production of these textbooks? Um, were they really controlled by state? No, they were not. They were not. So, I mean, that's why, in a way, that's where the Foucauldian framework helps me, because I'm not looking at the authors. I'm not looking, I mean, I, for some kind of studies, it matters where there was oppression, where there was like control over the writing. What I'm trying to put, like, by, by right now seeing the text, is that some of them come from very conservative uh, publishers. Some of them come from very progressive uh, publishers. Some of them come from very established scholars. And some of them come from uh, more uh, textbook writers that are not from the field of history or, or like, right? So, but the reason I'm not looking at who is the author is because what I'm carrying out in this particular project is in how does discourses become reasonable? How is it that when you look at all this as a group, you have this streamline of what it means to educate the responsible citizen? So how these things about what is possible or not to say, it's not because someone tells you you can't say that, but it's because that's outside the thinkable space of the production of a textbook. So that's why in this particular kind of study, it's not about who writes it, but it's about what is available to our thought, what is available to us as a particular way of thinking about a process or in this case, a textbook. So uh, there is a, a huge aspect of the production of the textbooks and things that are being left out, but I'm more interested in when you look at them as a whole. And I'm looking only at textbooks that appear up to 2006, which is when I was doing this particular analysis. The book just took a long time to come out. But the textbooks, the last textbook I have is from 2006. So some people have said, have told me that these, these views have become much more plural in the time since then. I haven't looked at that. Can I follow? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, then why not look at the historiography of, of uh, contemporary Argentina? I mean, in the sense that there is probably a, a lot to be said about the embedded memories of the, um, of the dictatorship in historiographical writing mm -hmm. um, that might not be revealed in what you have just said are sometimes um, not exactly professional uh, writers uh, you know, right. presenting historical narratives. I think one way in which that what you're saying is, point, is there's this book called No Matar. I don't know if you know it. Um, it's or No Matar. No, no Matar. It's it's a republishing of a debate that happened in a couple of uh, magazines in Argentina between different intellectuals from the left. Now, sort of, sort of like taking responsibility for some of the violence that was taking place before the dictatorship, right? And the reactions to those debates. And the, the, the appearance of the book created a lot of debate because what these people were doing was kind of betraying the, 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 the view of the saints, uh, the disappeared of saints, right? And, 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 and it was interesting, but up to the point I had seen, that hadn't penetrated textbooks. The reason I focus on textbooks is because I'm in curriculum and instruction. And, and, mm, I'm an educator and I'm a curricular study, uh, studies person. So I think there's a debate in historiography. But again, um, then the question becomes, how is it that when we think about pedagogy, how is it when we come, we translate this historical consciousness into a pedagogical device? There are certain things that are transformed into something else, right? Uh, Tom Popowitz talks about alchemy in terms of how 
the content of history, the content of math, when it becomes pedagogical, becomes something else. Not because it loses seriousness, but it becomes something that is supposed to form a person in its, in, in its psychological development uh, as a citizen and as a, as a good person. So there are things that are infused in it, things that change, so it becomes something different. So the reason I'm not looking at a historical debate is because my interest is in the field of education. But it's, I think I'm not dismissing the question at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, two, three questions. Uh, first of all, going back to something that Sanya mentioned, uh, what about these other types of art, like film or theater, or other possibilities like mm -hmm. the internet? How is that incorporated into the curriculum or learning process? And another question, the, like, is it necessary to have like some kind of uh, like an acknowledgement or recognition in order to move forward? So in, in order to how our film, and I, I looked somewhat at, the, at films and, and, and how those are included in the curriculum, and, and part of it came from Senia's course. It's interesting the kinds of films that make into curricula. The kinds of films that tend to make into curriculum are films that have clear lessons, that have clear good and bad guys, that have clear establishment of why is it that we should value the present, democracy, and all that, and how terrible that time was. Whereas films that are a bit more complicated in their views, like Los Rubios, are never part of the curriculum because, again, what are students going to make out, make, out, make out of this? So the problem is, remains. I mean, it, it, even in these other forms, the issue with pedagogy is the need to establish goals or lessons in advance of the experience that students are going to go through, right? In order to protect the democratic essence. Um, and your second question was, oh, about recognition. You can uh, establish in advance the end point, and you can say you're done. Um, study, on the other hand, is a dwelling. It's a way in which you get submerged in a particular topic without necessarily knowing why you're getting there, and definitely not knowing when it's going to end, because there are no indicators, no measurable indicators of when study is over. So in a way, what I'm trying to say here is that a few things is that, first of all, the park offers a possibility of study that pushes against the limits of schooling, a place that usually is not visited by many schools. And in particular, when I went to, to, uh, to Virginia to do my field work, I, I tried to go with the school that I worked at uh, to two spaces, and the principal said yes to the museum and not to the park, because what are they going to learn here? Right? What is it that you can learn from a space where there is no guide, where you just walk around. And, and I think one of the interesting things about this space is that it allows for, for us to think of pedagogy, learning, because in schooling, more and more, it becomes harder to find spaces of study. Which is not to say that that's the only thing schools so should do. I, I have to be very clear here. I think the museum, I think the textbooks and all that have a very important role in schooling. But the museum, in some ways, does something that schools already can do. They don't necessarily do it well, and the museum does it differently. But this idea of presenting a place in which the lessons to be learned are predetermined and are clear. The, the park, on the other hand, is bringing and studying in different spaces. One, one aspect that I did not include in the in the book, because I, I got to read this book after I finished mine, is there's a, there's a philosopher of education called Tyson Lewis who, who wrote a book distinguishing between learning and studying. And he said, learning is the reigning paradigm in education not right now, and it's set up by the objectives one, one sets in advance. It, learning, you, you can be done with learning by assessing that learning and figuring out whether you have learned or not. It presents a notion of democracy that is different, that is based on trust and on the possibility of things going wrong, on the possibility of circling that space and not knowing in advance what kids or adults are going to learn from it, of maybe people going to a space and learning nothing. And I think that possibility um, is necessary to think about how to incorporate that possibility into schooling, into thinking of the curriculum in different ways. Because otherwise, we're foreclosing by trying to plan something that's unplanned.